Ja bih počeo od toga da je uloga srpskih intelektualna... Because genocide in the historiography of Serbia started being politicized uh, from the memorandum of the Serbian Academy of Science and Art. And Roger Cohen uh, said in his works that Milosevic treated genocide as a term uh, too much. He talked about the various types of genocide that do not exist as a category or such as an embargo or international uh, relations. These are all types of genocide against Serbia. And therefore, this abuse of the term genocide led to the fact that when we had genocide, which actually happened, the abuse of the term blurred it. And we had the great opportunity to talk, to talk about and discuss various types of interpretations from various perspectives of various disciplines here. But genocide as such is a legal category in its essence. So when we get these types of interpretations from the intellectual elites and we have uh, it politicized, then we get a completely different view of what it is. The role of intellectual elites, uh, primarily the role of the biggest ideologist, Serbian ideologist, Dobrica Ciosic, has been um, decisive not only for the war in Bosnia but also for the history of Serbia in the 20th century and the reason for that is that Ciosic together with his followers is someone taken for granted in Serbia because he was close to all the leaders from Tito to Boris Tadic in Serbia. So there was no doubt that he was highly respected and his works, particularly uh, the last two works, um, The Times of Snakes and The Bosnian War, these two books are full of racist, xenophobic, horrible statements. But that this is such should not be problematic. It's not revolutionary for Ciosic. It's a discourse that he has been propagating for the last three decades. But what is problematic with these works is that when these books appear, then... President Boris Tadic uh, found that it was his role to defend Ciosic. And on the other hand, we have these books published by the state-owned official gazette, meaning that the state is behind these books. So the problem is that this discourse is entering the political elites and the educational system. Roger Cohen um, differentiated between three types of um, crimes. So we have the actual full denial of facts we have the interpretative where the facts are put in a different context and the implicatory where we uh, have the minimization of the psychological moral or any other aspect both in the serbian the society and elsewhere so the political elites in serbia um, have applied each of the types of denial um, that i've mentioned over the last 15 years we know more or less everything about Milosevic. As Mrs. Nevenka said, we need three more lives to study the evil uh, that Milosevic committed. But first, I'd like to tackle the democratic European-oriented leaders who were supposed to lead us to changes and make this turn because they got votes to lead the European and the democratic politics, but it never happened. First was Vojislav Kostunica, uh, who was the president of um, first Yugoslavia and then Serbia. He had a range of historical opportunities to make this cut with the past and to uh, clearly take a stance towards genocide in Srebrenica. He had a chance after the fall of Milosevic, uh, after the arrest, after the prime minister's murder, um, after many events that were happened, there were many opportunities, but it never happened. And everyone is asking the question why. And I think the answer is very simple. It is. It just takes an analysis of his rhetorics of the 90s, his aspirations towards Republika Srpska and 
the bizarre politics that he led. Everything that comes down to a statement which is related to genocide. He said it was counter-offensive and defensive action of the army of Republika Srpska. He thinks that's what happened. And later, when thousands of people were um, killed, he said that the situation in Bosnia did not change. So often the question is asked, how come? And that's it, there is no answer. So this is uh, the man who had a very clear political discourse, a horrific discourse towards Bosnia. And later you, that is reflected also to in his relationship to the ICTY. He did not respect ICTY. He said that it's completely irrelevant and therefore uh, people who were arrested for the violations of international law in his view were completely irrelevant. So after Tadic came to the president's position, he um, counted of the voluntary uh, voluntary uh, uh, arrest or voluntary uh, giving oneself to the to the ICTY, which did not happen. All these generals have been first arrested, and then the discourse was developed. And Kostunica not only made the distance from Milosevic, he basically inherited all of his foundations, particularly the security sector, and he refused to dismiss the most responsible persons of the. Milosevic regime. And by that, he kept the overall establishment. So formally, we just replaced one man and the overall structure remained the same. So he wasn't able to make any type of discontinuity with uh, the criminal structure that Milosevic led. Uh, with Tadic, the trend continued. And when Tadic, or we say Tadic, even though Mirko Cvetkovic was the prime minister, but Boris Tadic was basically one who um, encompassed all the foundations of the government. And Boris Tadic was perceived as a guy who has a peaceful politics, moderate, accepted by Europe, accepted by the region. So in that sense, he was desirable, so to say. He was appropriate for everyone, even though his politics was the politics of relativization. And during his time, Radovan Karadzic was arrested, the declaration on Srebrenica was adopted, and Radko Mladic was arrested. And the manipulation with fear that they exercised in Serbia basically um, continued. And when Mladic and Karadzic were adopted, nothing, were arrested, nothing happened. The motives are very complex. It often happens that you have an arrest before Catherine Ashton arrives and you have the second arrest so when there, or you have the declaration when the, there were threats of um, blockades in Serbia. So I don't want to go into details, but to mention the declaration paradox, it is really a paradox that the declaration does not say that Srebrenica is a genocide. It does relate to the legal qualification that has been determined by the international court. So it's a word play. Crime, not genocide, but classical relativization. But since the declaration was adopted, uh, Milosevic's party positioned itself as a pro-European constructive party working for the welfare of Serbia. Now I'll go to this very unpleasant topic of Zoran Džinđić. He was an exquisite politician, very open in his democratic orientation, but his relationship towards Bosnia in Serbia is often being neglected and forgotten. And there is a hypocrisy of the NGOs and also people who um, belong to a different Serbia, so to say, because there is this collective amnesia when it comes to uh, Džinđić's relationship to Bosnia. And the first thing there is that Zoran Džinđić made the discontinuity uh, with the politics of Milosevic. His government was the uh, only government in the region with the trend of discontinuity, unlike Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though his relationship with the ICTY was a bit contradictory. And I fully understand, and of course I'm not an expert in political science, I 
I understand that we have to take a wider context in the consideration and his position, but the facts point to him leading politics that not did not deny the crimes, but that meant that he does not want to apologize because that reminds him of the collective responsibility and what he left behind as a legacy is the arrest of Milosevic. But that's where his mission ends. So Mladic and Karadzic were people he could not get his hands on. So there were meetings and with Carla del Ponte and there were processes, but when he was a prime minister, he had some uh, statements that Mladic is not a citizen of Serbia, that Serbia doesn't know where he is, even though everyone knew where Mladic was. And I think that the key mistake of the ICTY was that ICTY saw its role as a role different to the court's role. So uh, the ICTY was thinking of the political effects on the countries of former Yugoslavia. I think that the main task of the court is to make justice more efficient, which is important for victims and survivors, because any type of delays... Um, means mean also um, change in evidence and change of statements and loss of memory and also loss of interest of the international community for the region. This is what happened uh, with the ICTY and the International Call for Rwanda because you had Congo, you had 9-11, you had shifted focuses and one of the circumstances which was aggravating in facing the past in Serbia is education, the very strong role of the forces of intellectual elites in the educational system. Kolik Stojanovic excellently analyzed uh, historical textbooks in Serbia. The textbooks were changed in 93-94 and then later in 2002, but still there is this dominant narrative on uh, self-pity and self-victimization and the messages are clear in the textbooks so basically you have 20 generations of young people going through those textbooks and these textbooks are very clear as to the political elite's attitudes about wartime events and this i mean events war events in the 40, 1940s so we are still in World War II. And what I was interested in is higher education and what is being offered to students when it comes to Srebrenica. And I analyzed various types of textbooks, collections of texts in the international criminal law and humanitarian law. And it is a very obsolete group of documents so the discussions are about whether there was a basis for the Security Council to establish a court and when genocide is mentioned in all textbooks, it is something that is defined somewhere in the convention on half a page, no examples. I'm not saying that Srebrenica must be an example, but there are no examples whatsoever. So you have half a page, quote from the convention, and this is it. The only textbook which is official and I managed to find, and it mentions the Srebrenica case, and this is the interpretative model of denial, uh, this textbook mentions Srebrenica and says, I will quote, the case of Srebrenica, the author wants to admit the crime, nobody is here defending the perpetrators, but it is important to say that the numbers of killed people should not uh, should be exact, and this is a discourse of the revenge of Serb soldiers. So the question is whether such a type of the Serb revenge could be interpreted as genocide. So it is the interpretative denial, and the student, when they read this. They cannot clearly understand what this is about. So 
and now the question is what a student of law must answer uh, in the test in order to get a passing mark. So I analyzed another textbook from Strategic Marketing, which was drafted. Um, it's not a textbook, it's a study that was conducted by the university. Uh, uh, which showed that the majority of people had no knowledge whatsoever of history, not only about crimes committed against Serbs, but also crimes that Serbs committed. So many people have no idea um, how long was the siege of Sarajevo. Many people do not know that there was a siege of Sarajevo. Many people do not know about crimes committed against Serbs. So the researchers basically established that there is a clear uh, consequence of the political messages that have been sent out to the public for... 20 years. I entitled my work Zamuchivanya Stvarnosti, which is not blurring reality. So when you're making something, so you, you want to mix uh, Chosic, Tadic, educational system, and you make uh, this foam of all of that, where words lose their weight, where you basically are left with a shell that speaks of nothing. Thank you very much.